My name is Jim Lakely. I'm the Director of Communications at the Heartland Institute. I want to thank you all for being here today um, to see uh, Stephen Moore at the Heritage, uh, the Heritage Foundation. And as you look, feeling freedom. Uh, as I said, you should be in here very shortly after this radio, um, radio program. And I just want to tell you, take this opportunity that I have to tell you a little bit about the Heartland Institute. Um, I see a lot of familiar faces in here, and we saw some people I haven't seen in a while, but I'd be glad to see, but I also see a lot of new faces. So I want to take this opportunity to give a little bit of a background on the Heartland Institute. Uh, we are a 32-year-old free market think tank uh, founded by libertarian economists who got around the table regularly here in Chicago and decided that uh, the Midwest is its own think tank fighting for free markets uh, against crony capitalism, for more individual liberty, uh, against large government and for less government involvement in our lives and our economies. And um, we've been doing that now for 32 years. For 31 of those years, we were located here in the Loop uh, in Chicago. I'm very happy to be here. But we're also very happy to have left. <laughs> we feel like we're just getting out ahead of the posse sometimes. So uh, good luck to you all. We're still here. <laughs> but we uh, were lucky enough to buy a new building in Arlington Heights uh, in the northwest suburbs. Uh, we moved in there in August of last year, so we're coming up on our one-year anniversary. Um, those of you here who have not yet come out to our new office uh, on North Wolfie Road in Arlington Heights, I really hope to see you there soon. It is a fantastic facility. Um, and we have events like this there every week um, in, a, in our own space for these kind of events. So that's great. Pushing forward that free market message. Um, so we hope to see you out there uh, then. Uh, as you also, a lot of people in this room know, uh, the Heartland Institute is happy to welcome Steve Moore here because he's been a friend of ours for a long time. But he's also, his book, Fueling Freedom, is about uh, the energy sector and environment. And a lot of people here, I'm sure, are aware that the Heartland Institute is known more uh, than anything else globally, but for our work on the environment. In fact, uh, we're quite a target by the eco-left, as I call them, because we've been so effective in our, in our mission on free market environmentalism to convince the public and politicians and policymakers that there is not a climate crisis caused by humanity, that the up and down of the climate is well within natural variation, and that the science does not prove, not even really come close, that humans are causing runaway global warming, a huge rising of the sea levels, all of those things. And we stand up on the science on that fact. And standing up for science is so controversial, we have the very well-funded members of the EcoNet, the Greenpeace's, the uh, 350.org's, the George Soros's, the Tom Steyer's, the Sierra Club's, all coming after the Heartland Institute. And in fact, joining forces with the government to try to come after the Heartland Institute and others that are in the climate realism camp who fight for free market environmentalism. Uh, you may have heard um, of a group called Attorneys General for uh, United for Clean Energy. About, I don't know, four or five months ago, they had a press conference starring Al Gore and themselves, uh, announcing that they're going to come after quote unquote climate deniers, but really people who are skeptical of the hypothesis that it's not being proven that humans are causing a climate crisis. And a lot of our friends, like the Competitive Enterprise Institute for one in Washington, D.C., has been subpoenaed by the Attorney General of the Virgin Islands. Raise your hand if you knew they had one. <laughs> but apparently he's able to, <laughs> he's able to issue subpoenas to the Competitive Enterprise Institute asking for all information, all correspondence with the evil ExxonMobil Corporation. Because supposedly ExxonMobil lied about global warming, lied to their uh, shareholders, lied to the world, that humans are not causing the climate crisis. And for this, they have committed fraud, apparently. That's the legal theory. And a co-conspirator in this fraud are organizations like the Competitive Enterprise Institute and the Heartland Institute. We have not received our, our own, genuine own subpoena. I'm really disappointed, frankly. <laughs> We're waiting, though. We are named in all in these subpoenas. The, the Attorney General of New York has issued a subpoena. The Attorney General of the Virgin Islands has issued a subpoena. And as we learned last week, because Exxon is countersuing, uh, the Attorney General of Massachusetts has also issued a subpoena. And the Harlem Institute's named in all of it. And they want every little bit, and you'd have to read these to believe them. I'm no lawyer, but I can see, a, I can tell a broad, you know, witch hunt, fishing expedition when I see one. 
And that's what these subpoenas are. They want every little bit of correspondence you've ever had with ExxonMobil. They have mentioned the words, they have keywords in there, climate change, um, denier, uh, sea levels, temperature. And search for all of these and uh, you know, hire a whole staff to go forensically look for all of your emails and share these things because we want to know, I don't know, if you've been up to no good. Um, our friends at the Confederate Enterprise Institute are fighting that subpoena. Um, when we get one, we will also fight it. Uh, because this is, at heart, an attack on free speech. It's an attack on the other, it's really an attack on an individual, be it a corporation, a nonprofit, or even people in this room, to disagree with state dogma on a topic of science. The day that becomes illegal in the United States is the day we're not in the United States anymore. And so the Harvard Institute has been fighting this, we've been keeping our eye on it, and we will continue to do so, and, and we will do so, obviously, obviously, with the support of a lot of people in this room and me. Um, thank you very much for that support. And in fact, if you are not yet a donor to the Harvard Institute, uh, we very much encourage you to join us in this fight for science, this fight for free markets, this fight for individual liberty. Um, there's information and many staffers here that can help you to join the Heartland Institute and join us in this fight. Um, with that, I see our guest has arrived, and so I will now introduce him <laughs> so we can begin the program proper. Um, Stephen Moore has had a hand in some of the most influential organizations in the United States promoting the virtues of free markets and economic growth. Uh, he is currently uh, the Distinguished Visiting Fellow for the uh, Project for Economic Growth at the Heritage Foundation. Now, immediately before taking his current position at Heritage in 2014, he wrote on the economy and uh, public policy for the Wall Street Journal, and uh, is also a member of the Wall Street, the Wall Street Journal's editorial board. Uh, Moore, of course, returned, as I mentioned, to Heritage in 2014. Uh, he had been serving with that organization since the Reagan administration, serving as the think tank's uh, Grover and Herman Fellow in Budgetary Affairs from 1984 to 1987. Uh, Moore today focuses on advancing public policies that increase the rate of economic growth to help the United States retain its position as the uh, global economic superpower. He also works on budget, fiscal, and monetary policy and showcases states that get their fiscal houses in order. You might imagine that's a pretty short list. And Illinois is not among them. <laughs> Moore's early career was shaped by three people who had profound influence on him. Julian Simon, the late Cato Institute scholar. A round of applause by Jim Johnson for him. And for everyone. Ed Fulner, the uh, co-founder of the Heritage Foundation. And of course, Art Laffer, the economist best known for the Laffer Curve and having such an influence on the uh, excellent economic policies of Ronald Reagan. Moore calls his creation of the Club for Growth in 1999 the defining moment of his career. The organization, which he left in, 20, in 2004, helps elect conservative members of Congress, including current Heritage President Jim DeMitt when he ran uh, for Senate for the first time. And Moore also founded the Free Enterprise Fund that then went on to the Wall Street Journal and then back to Heritage. So follow me on the quiz later. Moore, of course, is a local. He grew up in Utrecht Township, Illinois. He received a Bachelor's of Arts degree from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. He was a Master of Arts in Economics from the great George Mason University. He's the author of several books, uh, including Who's the Fairest of Them All? The Truth About Opportunity, Taxes, and Wealth in America. The Encounter Broadside, Moore versus Krugman, which I recommend you read. It's the Frilla in Manila envelopes. <laughs> And with co-author Kathleen Hartnett White, he's written the book that he's here to talk about today, a very important one called Fueling Freedom, Exposing the Mad War on Energy. It is my great pleasure to welcome to the stage Steve Moore. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for being here. Um, it is so fun to see so many, um, so many personal friends. I have some high school classmates from here. I went to New Jersey High School. In 1978. Um, I still consider Chicago home, even though I haven't lived here for 30 years. So thank you, Jim, so much for hosting this and for the Outland Institute. And what an amazing organization you have. I don't think there's any organization in America that has done better work um, exposing the fraud of global warming than, than the Outland Institute. So thank you for doing that. Because this I think global warming is the greatest.
greatest scam in the last hundred years. And I think it was a real threat to our, it may be the most important threat to our liberty and freedom and economic welfare out there. So thank you for the amazing work that you guys do and on budget and tax policies and other things. Um, I uh, had a great weekend here in uh, Chicago and uh, I was uh, playing golf here yesterday and I was on the golf course. I was in the, coming out of the clubhouse and this woman, she ran up to me. It was so cute. She ran up to me and she saw me. She said, I know you, don't I? I <laughs> She said, I, 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 I'm sure I've seen you on TV before. And, uh, it was really so cute. And, uh, and, she, and I said, uh, um, she was just so full of joy. And I said, well, I don't know, man, what do you watch? And that kind of confused her. And, and it was so funny. She kind of made the light bulb went on. She said, wait a minute. She said, didn't I just see you on Wheel of Fortune? <laughs> How many of you watch Fox News, by the way? Um, how many, anybody watch on MSNBC? Um, so uh, let me tell you a little bit about the book, and then I'd, I'd love to just take questions from you all um, about what's going on with the economy or politics, whatever you want to uh, want to talk about. You mentioned, by the way, Jim, um, Julian Simon, and, and our laugher, and you know I consider myself a really pretty lucky guy because I think those are two of the great, great economists of the last 50 years. Uh, I, by the way, I was also friends with Milton Friedman, so I've been you know, three times um, uh, lucky in that regard. But um, Julian, for those of you who don't know, the thing that was so similar about Julian Simon and Uncle Laffer is they were saying things about how the, the world works that was contrary to what everybody else was saying. You know, so when I met Julian Simon at the University of Illinois in 1979, you, you know, remember that? We're running out of oil, we're running out of gas, the world is overpopulated, we're running out of farmland, uh, you know, 25 years from now, everything's going to be worse, not better. Um, and Julian was like one of the only people in the, in the country, if not the world, to say, all of this stuff that Paul Ehrlich and all these doomsday people are talking about is completely wrong. The life of the is getting better, that the price of oil and gas and coal and, uh, you know, farmland and, and food is going to go down, not up. And, and Julian was proven to be 100% uh, correct, right, and the, the doomsday was wrong. Um, so when Arthur Lapper started teaching us about the importance of taxes and that you know you can actually cut tax rates and put more growth and more revenues than sales matter, you know, Julie, both Julian and Arthur were seen as lunatics. You know, they were so personally assailed as, as you know, take away their academic credentials and of course everything that Arthur Lapper said about the Reagan tax cuts and so on. He was one of the architects of that was proven true uh, as well. So it's amazing that I've been able to um, be mentored by both of those incredible, incredible economists. So both of them um, deserve the, uh, the Nobel Prize in economics if that, if that was truly based on um, you know, changing the world. So, okay, here's what the book is about. Um, in one sense, if we get this right, uh, if we use our energy resources the way that we should, and we are the, the most richly endowed country in the world with energy, that uh, within five or six years, not only can the United States of America be independent, which we certainly can be, and that would be the first time in 50 years, but, uh, I, and by the way, I used to say that, Jim, all the time, and people would be stunned by it. I don't think anybody in this room is even stunned by that, right? You probably know that's true, because it's almost become a conventional wisdom that because of the shale oil and gas revolution, we, we can very easily become energy independent. But I've now taken that a step further, and I, I would make the case we not only can we be energy independent, but we now have the capacity to become the energy dominant country in the world. So we can, we can be essentially the Saudi Arabia of the next century if we get this right. And I would submit to you that has enormous implications, not just for our economy and the economic advantage. I don't have to tell you this, I mean, you, you all understand this very well, that if we are producing more and more energy than we ever have before, that's going to be millions of new jobs, it's going to be reducing our budget deficit, because it's going to be uh, about you know, uh, hundreds of billions of dollars additional tax revenues, we're going to reduce our trade deficit. Uh, by the way, the, the jobs that we are going to create in the energy industry are high, the kind of high-paying middle-class jobs that Americans want back. So we're talking about you know, jobs like construction workers and truck drivers and petroleum engineers and um, you know, uh, welders and pipe fitters. And these are jobs uh, that pay 60, 80, 100,000 dollars a year. And uh, those are exactly the kind of jobs Americans do want to see. Uh, return to this country. And just as an aside, I think it's very interesting right now that if 
what Republicans have an incredible opportunity, in my opinion, on this issue of energy. Uh, and basically, because we're going to go full in for using all of our resources. And the reason for that is the Democrats have a lot of, um, they have an internal struggle within their party right now. And, and when you think about it, and this is a, this is a struggle that Republicans haven't done a good enough job uh, exploiting. Think about who the two most gigantic and uh, the big funders of the Democratic Party today. I would say that the two largest are obviously number one, the unions, right? The unions are major donors to Democratic candidates. You know that in Illinois, more well, than just about any other state. The teachers unions run the state, obviously. But, but the other big um, faction of the Democratic Party is what I would describe as a, a fairly lunatic green movement in America that is getting stronger all of the time, unfortunately. And I say lunatic because I think most of, a lot of the things that these hard left green groups believe in are extremely dangerous. Um, so the green groups, what they're saying right now is what we ought to do, uh, if their new strategy is keep it in the ground. Don't use any of our energy. Stop drilling for oil. Stop mining for uh, for coal. Stop going after a natural gas research. Just keep that in the ground. Now, when you think about it, who would be hurt the most by that? Well, it would be unions, right? The people who do this job are union workers. So all those people that I just described, the truckers and the, and the welders and the pipers and the, all of those groups would be severely damaged. And the trick, I think, for Republicans is to drive that wedge. And actually, Trump is doing a pretty good job of this if he could get that on message and, and stop you know, insulting people. But if he would simply just talk about this issue and simply say, look, he should go to union, industrial union halls and say, we're the ones who are trying to save your jobs as the top people like Tom Steyer who are trying to destroy your jobs. And in fact, that happens to be true. So my point is, how do you have Tom Steyer, who's the billionaire who funds all of these um, candidates, and the industrial unions, how can they be part of the same party when their interests are completely divergent? Um, so we can be uh, energy um, dominant in the world. And I would make a couple of points about this. First of all, one of, the, one of the statistics that we used that I think no one else has used before is we worked with some of the great um, you know, kind of petroleum geologists and engineers, and, and we came up with some estimates about what is the worth, the asset value, of all the energy that we have in the United States today. I'm talking about the oil, gas, and coal. And they, were to, they tell us that, uh, based on all the latest, latest geological uh, surveys, that the United States, uh, underneath public lands, has somewhere near 50 trillion, that's trillion with a T, 50 trillion dollars worth of oil, gas, and coal. And Overnight, we doubled the amount of energy we had, and as the technologies get better, we'll have more and more and more. Um, and it's, it's funny because Barack Obama, as recently as three or four years ago, was running around the country saying the reason we have to move towards green energy is because we're running out of oil and gas. You know, he said pretty soon we're going to drill the last barrel of oil. Uh, Mr. President, with all due respect, America is not running out of oil and gas, we're running into it. Big, big, big time. And so uh, it's a, it's a uh, very good news story, but I wanted to then pivot back to the final point, and then, then I'll take some questions from you and whatever you want to talk about. So then, of course, there is the issue of global warming and uh, how are we going to keep the planet from, blow, uh, from heating up and blowing up if we don't do something about stopping. Um, stopping uh, fossil fuel development. And I, I would just have a few responses to that. First of all, I don't think global warming is a great crisis, but let's just for, I know this is a heartland institute audience, but let's for a moment suspend our disbelief. Let's say global warming is here to say that this is a great crisis. Uh, I would say a couple things about this. First of all, Wiped out 
completely. These towns of you know five or ten or fifteen thousand people, they've been completely eviscerated because of these regulations. The coal mines have shut down, uh, and now you go to these towns. I mean, it's heartbreaking to see what's happening in these towns, where once you had vibrant communities where people were actually producing coal and and had middle class lifestyles, they have been replaced with towns that are now unemployment lines of people on meth. And it's, it's just a disgrace. And then Hillary Clinton and, and Barack Obama talk about how much they care about working class people, right? They don't care about working class people. You saw what happened when Hillary Clinton went to West Virginia, right? I mean, and she, she tried to say, oh, well, you know, um, maybe we're not going to destroy every coal job. She will, she's president. But then, I mean, even more insulting, to give you a sense of how Stalinistic these liberals have become, she said, no, well, that's okay. You know, maybe we're not going to have coal mining jobs, but we're going to, you know what, we're, we're going to reassign you, and now you're going to make solar panels. I mean, not really. How insulting is that to these people? Um, you know, really, in, in, in the Appalachian Mountains, they're going to make solar panels? I mean, it's, it's just crazy. So, so that's part of what's going on. And so they say, well, let's shut down the iron. Well, that's going to sound cold. That's ridiculous. That's Crazy. And the reason it's ridiculous is because as we speak right now, as, we're, as I'm standing here, right now, China and India alone, just two countries, China and India, that have combined two billion people, China and India over the next two years are going to build at least 500 new coal plants. So we're shutting, for every time we shut down a coal plant, they build 10. How in the world does that shut down global warming? And I would make the case too, it actually makes it worse. As we shut down our energy development in the United States, it makes the planet worse, and here is why. Because we do have clean coal in the United States. We do, clean coal is not a myth, it's here to say, if you look at the, the emissions from coal plants today versus 50 years ago, there's just no comparison. Um, if you look at the, the and I, I know this is true because I've gotten these statistics from the Howland Institute, right? But if you look at the emissions uh, from, uh, from energy plants and utilities today versus 50 years ago, and you talk about real pollutants like carbon dioxide, I mean carbon monoxide, and lead and sulfur and things that actually make people sick and actually uh, you know, are real pollutants in the air, those pollutants from, from coal plants have been reduced 50, 60, 70, 80, in some cases 90 percent. So the amount of the clean coal is here. I guarantee you in China and India and Indonesia and these other countries, they haven't reduced their emissions. So all we're doing is displacing our coal factory, uh, plants for coal plants that are being built in, in other countries that are much dirtier and they actually emit more carbon into the atmosphere. So it's a setback for reducing carbon emissions and greenhouse gases when we shut down our energy. Um, the other point to, to make about this is, look, um, is there anybody who really believe? Uh, let me put it like this: When when Barack Obama says, "Well, we got this, we got this Paris Accord, right? You know, everybody's going to reduce their carbon emissions." I mean, Trump is right about. There's some things Trump is right about, some things wrong. He's exactly right about this. The rest of the country, the world, really is laughing at us at this. And I've noticed this so many times in dealing with in policy with, with Obama. Obama has this really weird. Um, he has this weird tendency to just believe what he wants to believe. So he wants to believe that they're going to you know, comply with these carbon emission standards, so it's going to happen. But meanwhile, when they say they're, they're going to do it, we see, we observe what's really happening in the world, which is they're, they are laughing behind our back. Final one. Um, so one of the problems we face as free market conservatives is that um, the kids have been indoctrinated with the anti-carbon global warming, greenhouse gas stuff since they've been in the kindergarten, right? And it's just, it's, it's um, an epidemic in the school. So that, that, it's not surprising by the time they're in high school and college, you know, they believe this stuff firmly. In fact, yeah, I learned on college, you, know, you can't even talk about global warming, you, know, you just can't, because it's, it's assaulting their religion to bring up global warming. You just don't get anywhere with these kids. Um, but what is so interesting about it is to talk, especially with high school and college kids, um, it is, it, the new thing is it's so cool to be brave, right? It's cool. We got to do this because what's going to be wonderful, we're going to use windmills and we're going to solar power and, um, you know, that's going to be so great for the planet. It's going to be great for the country. We're going to create all these green jobs and so on. And I always, I love to do this with the kids. I always say, okay, you kids think it's so wonderful to go with windmills and solar power and so on. I say, um, how many of you know where you get your electricity from? Where do you get your electric power from? And 
I get the same reaction, whether I'm at Yale or some, you know, inner city high school. The kids always say the same thing. Well, that's the stupidest question I've ever heard. Of course we know where we get our electricity from. It comes right out of that socket, right there. That's where the electricity comes. Kids, and by the way, most Americans don't even have any idea where they get their electricity from. I mean, it just comes out of the socket. Um, you probably know this because you're a well-educated um, you know, group of people, but where are they, what's the number one source of electric power today in the United States? Coal. Well, actually, coal and natural gas are almost exactly what used to be coal, but uh, I think actually natural gas might have slightly moved ahead of coal. Um, and, uh, so, but they're both somewhere around 35 to 40%. So that means we're getting about 75% of our electric power today from um, coal and a natural gas. Anybody know what's number three? Nuclear. Nuclear is about, what is it, about 10 or 15%, I think, of our electricity comes from nuclear. Um, anybody know what number four is? Hydropower. Hydropower. By the way, hydropower is actually a renewable source of electric production that actually works. I mean, hydropower is actually a really good way to get electricity. Um, so we combine all four of those with a few others, you're talking about well over 90% of electricity comes from, um, uh, from coal, natural gas, hydropower, and nuclear. Guess what? The left hates coal. They hate natural <laughs> gas. They hate, they hate hydropower. I mean, why in the world? Why do they hate hydropower? Yeah, they, they don't want dams built, right? So that you can't have hydropower because it kills fish. Uh, so, and then they hate, uh, and they hate nuclear power. By the way, nuclear power, how can it be because nuclear power? Nuclear power, if you actually believe that global warming is the greatest crisis that ever confronted the planet, there's no question what we would have. If we all of a sudden, all of us, that we had 100% proof that within 20 years, you know, we're going to have, we're going to be underwater and all the things that are wrong. If that were actually true, there's absolutely no question what we would have to do to preserve our living standard. We have to build 100 nuclear power plants, right? Because nuclear power plants are just a good way to get electricity. And guess what? They don't generate any uh, any uh, carbon whatsoever in the environment. Uh, but they're against all of those. And, and the, the, that's, I think, the point I'm making to you is I think there is something else going on here in terms of the war against energy. And that is that this has become so fanatical that it's not even about global warming, I don't think. I think it is a kind of religious idea that America is a bad place, industrialization is a bad thing, and it's almost like the penance we have to pay for what we have done as a country that we're going to have to, you know, go to pre-industrial age energy. And I think that's what we're up against, and it's a fight that we have got to win, and I think we will win, and when we do win, we're going to see an incredible economic future. I estimate the book that just developing the energy the resource that we have in the next 10 years, just that alone will raise our GDP growth rate by one percentage point. So in other words, right now we're growing at less than 2% under Obama, you all know that. What I'm saying is just the energy portion goes from 2 to 3. And then you can tax reform and other things, you can go from 3 to 4. We can grow at 4%. And ladies and gentlemen, the difference between 2% growth and 4% is huge, huge, huge. It's South over the top got. So thank you very much for having me. I know you have important lives and business meetings and stuff. If you have to leave, that's fine. But I'm willing to take you know 10 or 15 minutes of questions. And uh, and um, do you want to just uh, just put just put yeah. your hand up and we'll get the microphone over yeah. to you and uh, off you go. This is more first. Uh, thank you for your very exciting presentation. But two, could we make a business? To what? Perhaps could we make a business? Perhaps a new industry? on selling our clean coal technology in places like China and India and other places that burn it the way they do now, which is not to say the way we're doing it. You just made a point that so of our burning Can you repeat that? I'm sorry, I'm, not, I'm a little hard. Can you, sell, can you sell the clean coal technology? What, what I'm asking oh, yeah. can we do it? So, I mean, it's a great question. A couple of things about that. First of all, you know, my uh, niece is in, um, it, it just got back from the Peace Corps. This is a roundabout way of answering the question, but my niece was in the Peace Corps, and she was in Africa. She was in some remote village in Tanzania. And I went out and visited her um, a, a couple of years ago, and she was there. And um, how many of you have ever been to Africa? 
raise their hand. A lot of you have. And you go to these wrong villages, it, it is really an amazing thing to see. I mean, these, these people, the greatest people I've ever met in my life, by the way, I love, I love the African people that I met, but they're truly living like it's the 16th century. You know, they don't have, and the two things that they don't have that they need that would massively increase their living standards would are what? They need electric power, and they need clean water, right? Those just, just give them electric, and we don't have to give them to them, just they have to give them access to electric power and clean water, and you're gonna reduce their death rate, you're gonna have huge, huge advances, and, and you know, you probably increase their life expectancy for 10 years just by doing those two things. So my point about telling you that is, there's a morality issue here, I think, that our side should, you know, we, we too often give up, we give them the moral high ground. We have the moral high ground on this issue. I mean, imagine going to these, you know, countries and saying, you shouldn't use natural gas, and you shouldn't use oil and coal, you should use windmills. I mean, they, guess what? There's a, the best chapter of our book was not written by me, but my co-author, um, Kathleen Hardin White, who tells the story of the Industrial Revolution. And it's a, it's a, you know, I'm an economic historian, and I didn't really fully appreciate this. The real story of the Industrial Revolution, we all, all know this, that the Industrial Revolution was the massive leap forward in living standards in, in the Western world, right? Once we started using modern, modern manufacturing and machinery and steam engines, things like that, I mean, living standards soared. So um, we all know that, right, from our history books. What's not well known is the real history of the Industrial Revolution is a history of fossil fuels. So what happened is, in the, in the mid to late 18th century, mankind stopped using, what did they use before? You know, coal and, and, and gas and things like that. They used windmills, right? That's how they got the electricity. Guess what, electricity is not a very good way to get electric power. It's extremely expensive and inefficient and unreliable. And what happened was mankind moved away from using green energy and they started you know, using fossil fuels. And that's what helped power this incredible revolution in living standards. My point is, these poor countries still haven't even really gone through the Industrial Revolution. That's the most important thing. Give them access to power, it'll improve their health care, it'll improve and all of these other things. And there is, it is truly immoral for these green groups to go to these countries and say, no, you shouldn't have electric uh, power. Now, your point, yeah, uh, and as China gets richer, and as India gets richer and Mexico gets richer, yeah, they're going to clean up their environment the way we have. I don't know, how many of you have been to Beijing? Raise your hand. I mean, the air quality in Beijing, as when I was there, was awful, right? I mean, you can hardly breathe there in, in Beijing. 25, 30 years from now, I think they're going to go through the same, you know, clean, air standards that we did. But first you have to develop. And my point is that as you get richer as a nation, then you spend more money on environmental improvement. And that will happen here, just as it happened here, will happen all over the world. Yeah, they're going to have clean, clean coal, they're going, to, they're going to reduce their emissions of other things. But the one thing they are way behind on us, though, is fracking technology and, high, and uh, horizontal growing. They still haven't figured that one out. What else? A question in the back? Yes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Yeah. Um, so from the very poor countries, let's go to the very wealthy countries. And as the United States, under your view, exploits these natural resources and obviously offers them on the market for sale, what will the impact be to our friends in the Gulf? And what, what do you see as the sort of mid and longer term effects of greater U.S. dominance in the global energy marketplace? That's a great question. I kind of neglected to bring this up. But I think the question is actually, it's kind of obvious what the answer is, uh, with, uh, which is that, uh, you know, why have we been so integrally involved in the Middle East in the last 50 years? It's because they have oil. I mean, it's because they have oil. So, you know, I think that the United States presence in the Middle East could be vastly reduced if we're producing our own oil and gas and not relying on Saudi Arabia and these other uh, countries. Um, a lot of these other countries simply won't, um, won't be the, you know, the geo-strategic place on the planet that they are on. And that would be, to me, that's a good thing, not a bad thing. Um, you know, it'll, it'll shift the balance of power away from the Middle East to, to North America. By the way, I, you know, I, I like to lump the U.S. and Canada together, and that's because, you know, we're like one super region. Um, 
Yeah, it's huge. I mean, it just, it's just, it, and we're fighting terrorism. I mean, why in the world would we set, would we send our dollars to Iran and to Saudi Arabia and to Venezuela and to Russia and all these other countries when we can produce this here? And we know, I mean, there's an article in the um, Wall Street Journal the other day that um, they were estimating that ISIS gets about five to $10 million funding, dollars of funding a week from petrodollars. So let's put ISIS out of business. Let's just stop sending money to the terrorists. Uh, the big thing now is one world government. Is uh, what? One world government. Oh, is it on? Okay. The big thing now is one world government, and Agenda 21 is a lot about sustainability, and sustainability is all about global warming. And the reason why they don't want fuel in Africa is because it would increase the emissions, the carbon emissions. And this is the whole role of the UN to reduce the carbon emissions. So it's not only the United States, it's what the UN is kind of costing upon the countries of the world to get rid of fracking, get rid of coal, get rid of all this stuff. And we have to go to windmills because global warming is the thing. And this is so believed. So let, let me just give you guys some interesting um, statistics. Um, Anybody want to take a guess today at what percentage of our power, um, you know, all of our energy, what percentage of our energy today in America comes from wind and solar power? Two to three percent. I heard somebody over here say, who said this? I heard somebody say two percent. One percent. Uh, sir, you're way behind the times. We're up to 2.8 percent. So, you know, this is like this. People are living in this la la land, this fantasy land. I mean, we read like the Sierra Club, and they go, we're going to go from three to four, you know, let's, let's say we're even, maybe not, in a few years we might be up to 4%. By the way, this is after the United States government, just the last 10 years, under the Bush, it was horrible on energy policy, and Obama, who's even worse. They've spent $150 billion subsidizing this stuff. When you see somebody, I don't know if you have these in Illinois, because it's not the sunniest place, but do they, you know, there are any solar installations going on up here in, in uh, Illinois? Uh, uh, they have because, I mean, a lot of places, I mean, in Virginia, everybody's putting solar panel on their house. Well, if you see somebody putting a solar panel on their house, guess what? You pay for it, you pay for it, you pay for it. I mean, the government's basically making it free, and then they're subsidizing the electricity they get. It's the biggest scam that ever happened. So even after spending $150 billion in taxpayer subsidies over the last 10 years, it still only accounts for 2 or 3 or 4% of our electricity. So that other 96% comes from these uh, sources that we, uh, that we were just um, talking about. Um, the other kind of interesting thing about this is, um, can anybody in this room tell me, of all the industrialized countries in the world, like the, all the OECD countries, the 30 or so, which of those countries over the last 10 years has reduced its carbon emissions the most? United States. The United States. United States. The United States. How many of you do that? Uh, a lot of you did, a lot of you probably. Most people would be flabbergasted about that, right, Jim? How in the way of the United States, we've reduced our carbon How could that possibly be true? We didn't sign the Kyoto Treaty. We didn't do a capital trade system. We didn't have the, you know, the, the carbon tax, all these things no one wanted to do. We've rejected all of that. And, you know, we reduced our carbon emissions more than the sanctimonious Europeans who did sign all of these treaties as they know they're reduce their carbon emissions and so on. And what does anybody know why that is? Why is it we're reducing our carbon emissions? I know you know that. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Why is that? Why are we reducing our carbon emissions so much? What are we using? Gas. Gas. Natural gas. Natural gas is a wonder fuel. It turns out the future is natural gas, right? Natural gas is a is a fuel that is abundant. It's made in America. It's cheap and it's clean burning, right? It emits almost no carbon emissions in the atmosphere. So you would think. The global warming people, this is another reason sometimes I suspect their motives. If they really believe that we have to do something to reduce carbon emissions, stop uh, greenhouse gases, they'd be doing you know, flips over uh, greenhouse, uh, over natural gas. And Jim, yet they hate natural gas too. So they're against anything that works, they're against anything that doesn't work, they're against. <laughs> anything else? Yes, sir. Yeah. Jerry, good to see you. Good to see you. We enjoy listening to you along with Larry Cutto and many other people. You guys, what station is that on here? Well, I'm going to ask you. <laughs> <laughs> I want to know how you get your hair. We got you very well on Arizona on Saturday afternoon. We like to hear you. Is that WLS or what WLS. station is Cutlow show on here? We well, you know what numbers on the guy. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Like, what number? Larry and I have been doing that radio show together for 20 
yours. I mean, it's his show, but I, every Saturday afternoon, I'm here. It's great. I, I like my weekend. Are you gonna, I'll tell them you said that, by the way. Okay, okay. are you going to tell everybody how to get you on the radio on Saturday? Um, I think he knows. Are you going to tell us what your hours are to get the radio show? What are you on? What are we going to do? He doesn't know. Does anybody know? Oh, 890. What time? 890. What time? Come Saturday when no one called the show come out because they tape that show and every station does it. You know, I'm sort of funny. I do WLS with John, somebody who's the guy in the morning. John Howard. Yeah. And then I do Gavin Amy on Wednesday morning. So you've got some great conservative doctor here. So many we can't keep straight. I know. It's great. Hi. Thanks so much. Oh, oh. Um, one of the things that I grew up with school board and tried to uh, tell them that we needed to inject into the curriculum. Sorry, you, your third point was about um, kids being indoctrinated. And um, when I tried to mention the IPC secret board and how they were not um, up to stuff, and I didn't have the IPCC at the time of the Heartland, um, I was just going on with Hammer. Well, how, do you, how would you encourage us or direct us to? Um, Fire that battle within so, so, like, I, you know a lot more than I do about that. So, I'm going to answer your question around about that. Um, I think there is going to, obviously, we're in the, in the midst of one of the most important elections, I think, since 1980. This is just a gigantic election. We have to win, in my opinion. And um, I think, uh, what, what does every poll for the last three years tell us? What is the single most important issue America care about? Uh, sometimes it's terrorism when we have an attack, you know, something like what happened in Orlando. But when there is a terrorism attack, the number one issue is jobs, and the number two issue is the economy. Jobs one, two is the economy, and it's been that way for three or four straight years. Every single month, no matter what poll you talk about. What's really interesting about this is if you look at these, when people, when they ask Americans in these polls, you know, what is, what do you think the single most important issue is in the United States today? Um, you know, again, Jobs, economy, um, terrorism, one, two, three, and then maybe education is number four. And then they have what they do is they have a list of like the 30 people that things that people mention, you know, because these are open-ended polls. And I, I love to look at that poll because guess what's always 29th or 30th on that list? Number one. Number one. People don't care. Now look, if you talk to somebody on the street, if we just went out there and you know, just uh, the guy who's bad, do you think global warming is a problem? Oh, of course, we, you know, yeah, that's, I mean, of course people are going to say it. Yes, global warming is a great problem. If you ask a person, would you be willing to pay a nickel a gallon of gasoline more for just a combat global warming? They say, oh no. They don't, nobody wants to pay for this stuff, right? They want jobs and they want, you know, a strong economy. And so Republicans have to like make the case that this energy issue is about let them talk about global warming. We're going to talk about putting Americans back to work. 